views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to Business Game Changers, where you'll hear expert tips on the big issues and the hottest trends to level up your business game. If you're building a career or building a business, this is Must Hear Radio. Here's your host, Sarah Westall. Welcome to Business Game Changers. I'm Sarah Westall. Today we have an amazing interview with Albert Abel, who is the CEO of Jovian Energy. And he has a battery product that gives that lasts forever. It's an endless energy battery. And it's the amazing thing is it just it, it doesn't just work for little tiny things like calculators. It's going to be working for laptop computers and for cell phones and for bigger devices and they're planning to get this to market in 2016 and he's going to explain how this works and I mean how is that even possible to have an endless energy battery that works forever and he's going to talk about the zero point energy field and how they figured out how to use that to create this battery it's an amazing interview that I have and then after that, we talked to Tom Shepard, who has been on my program in the past, but we're bringing him back because we've had a lot of people ask about these seven natures that he has and how they really work. And he's going to dive into these seven natures more. And the seven natures is a way to um, what your natural tendencies are. And he's going to show you how your natural tendencies can be used for or against you to um, you know, work against your work for you when it comes to money and your health and how you can evolve and be smarter and happier and healthier by understanding who you are and who who the people around you are but first we're going to have the interview with albert abel from jovian energy hi al welcome to the program hi sir how are you today I'm doing great, and I have been really excited about this interview. You have a really, really interesting thing going on there, and, well, you claim, let's get right into this, you claim to have the ability to create a device which re requires no fuel, produces no waste, and supplies unlimited and continuous clean, safe, and affordable energy. How is that p even possible? You know, sir, that uh, has been a point of contention uh, ever since I came up with that uh, phrase. Uh, in our business plan, I, uh, I opened the plan by saying, imagine a device that requires no fuel, produces no waste, and yet produces clean, safe, affordable energy. And every time people would read that, they said, this sounds like perpetual motion, free energy, or too good to be true. And quite frankly, uh, that was a little frustrating because what I had to point out to people is, hey, I'm not the first person to do this. Jovian is not the first company to do this. What I described in that definition is, in fact, a technology which currently exists. It's currently a $500 plus million dollar a year business, and it's headed well up to $4 billion a year by the end of the decade. Uh, this is a this is a an industry and a technology that's known as energy harvesting. Okay, well, what is energy harvesting? Energy harvesting is the process of capturing small amounts of waste ambient energy for low energy applications. Uh, things like piezoelectric, thermoelectric, photoelectric. Uh, triboelectric, other processes are used to capture and utilize ordinary but wasted energy. Would that be also, would it also be solar? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If you think in terms of uh, a few years back when people used to wear watches and one of the new crazes was the self-winding watch and the watch actually gained its energy to wind itself from the movement of the uh, wearer's wrist. 
and this was a form, an early form of energy harvesting. Okay, so why, if if these devices exist, I know solar devices are starting to be used, you know, in mass, but why aren't people doing more stuff with solar or with energy harvesting? Uh, actually, uh, Sarah, energy harvesting is probably the, uh, it's kind of the great waking giant uh, that is going to be shaking the foundations of a lot of uh uh, commerce over the next uh, decade or two. Energy harvesting is a big, big business, and it's growing at a rate that is much faster than most people can even imagine. Uh, it is, uh, it's being applied to sensors for remote locations, uh, things like measuring uh, the stresses in aircraft skin, pretty much any place where you need to get some sort of tiny amount of electricity to do a very small job they're placing energy uh, harvesting devices. They're even putting these in people's uh, uh, bodies so that they can use their heartbeat to power their pacemaker. And so it's now, pretty much it's pretty much small quantities, stuff that are when when you're doing something that doesn't need mass energy. Most energy harvesting, but by no means all energy harvesting, uh, but most energy harvesting, yes, is focused on ambient waste energy that uh, is available in little tiny amounts and can only be sucked up in little tiny amounts. But as you pointed out, uh, solar energy is an example where massive amounts of energy can be captured, and once you have a solar operation in place, uh, that sits around and basically produces prodigious amounts of energy uh, all the period that the sun is actually shining, and uh, it is energy that uh, requires no fuel, uh, produces no waste, and yet it does produce tremendous amounts of energy, and it's clean, and it's safe. Well, but you believe you have uh, maybe a new and improved way of getting to uh, harvesting energy, and and you are using the quantum vacuum field. What is that? This is something that uh, I am tremendously excited about. We're not doing anything unique in terms of the concept of uh, energy harvesting. What is unique to Jovian is that we are focused on a totally novel source of energy, a source of energy which uh, modern physics accepts and knows and understands exists. But uh, up until this point, uh, modern physics has held the uh, position that uh, it's not possible to directly extract this energy for practical use. Uh, the quantum vacuum field uh, is often referred to as the zero-point field or zero-point energy or vacuum energy, and it's the ubiquitous universal underlying background field of electromagnetic energy which exists at the lowest possible energy state that a quantum vacuum mechanical system can exist at, the so-called ground state. In other words, if you think in terms of a pet clock pendulum that swings until it appears to finally stop, uh, in quantum physics, it never really stops. There is always a motion there, and this is, this is well understood within quantum physics, but that motion is always there, and at its lowest level, this is what's known as the uh, background field of the zero-point field. And in fact, it's maybe it's called the zero point field, but it isn't in fact truly zero point. There is always still a minute amount of energy. But it's so low that physicists uh, would tell you that it is not possible to uh, capture, directly capture this energy and utilize this energy because it's already at its lowest ground state. Uh, imagine a waterfall that has a hundred foot drop, a lot of energy. Imagine a waterfall that uh, has a uh, quarter-inch drop, almost no energy, certainly nothing that would be uh, practical to capture. So what Jovian has done, Jovian has found a unique backdoor approach whereby we, rather than extracting this energy from the quantum vacuum field directly, we believe that we are capable of extracting this energy indirectly because of a uh, rather unique interaction between the quantum vacuum field and ordinary matter. Well, and how do you do that? 
Uh, You're talking to an ignoramus, so even though I have an engineering background, I feel like some of this is going over my head, so I'm sure it's going over other people's heads as well. So explain it as if I'm a three-year-old. No, not a three-year-old, a a third grader. Let's go with third grader. I I think we can do that very simply. I I don't talk to ignoramuses uh, very (laughs) often, and I know that I'm not talking to one now. Uh, Well, and I think... And I think our listeners are 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 more a little more. Uh, they're smart. They're smarter than the average bear. They're not out there watching reality TV and things. They're they're listening to this. So they're they're pretty smart. So you 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 can explain it, it maybe a little bit above a third grader, but maybe not too much. <laughs> okay. Well, if you think in terms of a conventional model of the atom and uh, the electron. Uh, orbiting around the uh, nucleus of the atom. Uh, Think of that uh, electron that's orbiting as containing a level of energy, which it does. In fact, uh, if that uh, that electron is excited to a higher energy and then uh, is allowed to drop back down into the lower energy state, it throws off a packet of light called a photon. And this is precisely the same principle that an LED light operates on. On an LED light, the electrons are excited by the electrical voltage, and the electron jumps to a higher orbital. When it drops from that higher orbital to a lower orbital, it releases a photon or a packet or bundle of light. And that light can be captured uh, as either visible light uh, can be captured by photovoltaics, that is, solar cells, uh, or it can uh, be uh, released as light in the infrared frequencies, which means that it can be captured as heat. Now, what we are doing is basically the same thing. Uh, when an atom is passed within a very tiny cavity called a Casimir cavity, that atom is momentarily excluded from the energy of what's known as the quantum vacuum field. And there are some very good reasons for this, but I won't go into that amount of detail. But think in terms of an automobile driving down the highway, you're listening to the radio, and you come to a tunnel. And when you go into the tunnel, the signal from the radio station outside is blocked because of the tunnel. And when that happens, what happens to your radio? You lose the station. When you lose the station, you're out of music. But when you emerge from the tunnel, Suddenly, you're exposed to that energy from the broadcast tower. Your radio station comes back, and your music resumes. And what we are doing in uh, the Jovian process, we are basically uh, allowing atoms to go into a tunnel. And in that tunnel, they are momentarily shielded from the energy of the quantum vacuum field at specific frequencies. And what that does is that causes the electron to lose orbital energy. And when it does, it throws off a photon. We grab that photon using simple voltaic cells, and we convert that photon to electricity. Well, how and do you get it to go into? Basis, how do you go get it to go into a lower state of energy to be able to grab that that photon? The 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 energy in the electron. Uh, is maintained by the effect of the quantum vacuum field. Certain frequencies of the quantum vacuum field keep that electron going. If that electron uh, were not constantly being replenished with energy from somewhere, uh, it would lose its orbital energy because of angular acceleration or angular momentum. Um, and uh, this this is not allowed to happen. This is one of the things when the, the original concept of the Bohr atom uh, came out. It was actually uh, brought out by Rutherford. But when uh, Bohr looked at it, uh, one of the first things he said is the electron, uh, because it's in a circular orbit, it's losing energy constantly and what's known as a lot more radiation. And so consequently, uh, the concept that Brotherford came up with has to have a flaw in it somewhere, and that flaw is in that um, if there isn't uh, something to keep that electron going, uh, the electron is going to basically plunge into the heart of the atom, and matter as we know it can't exist. And this was one of the fundamental and uh, 
formative uh, discussions, which eventually resulted in the whole theory of quantum mechanics and quantum physics. So you're and grabbing those... Until, I'm sorry, keep going, but you're essentially grabbing the energy that the quantum energy field is giving, or vacuum field is giving back to the electron to keep it going. Right. Basically, we're, we're taking energy out of the electron's orbital and by passing it through the Casimir cavity, and we are then uh, using that to, to uh, uh, create a, a bundle of uh, energy that is the photon. And then as the uh, atom passes out of the cavity, it's re-exposed to the quantum vacuum field, and the electron is kicked back up to its ordinary normal Cause then you uh, put ground that, state. Then you put the energy that you took out back in to get it kicked up again, and then you take it out, more comes in, you take that out, and then you put the original back in, and it's just that constant process. Precisely. And the amount of energy we capture per transit of an atom through uh, a cavity, it's very small. It's on the order of 1 to 10 electron volts. And I generally uh, point people towards 1 electron volt because I tend to be very conservative in my my thinking. But uh, it's a very tiny amount. But when you then multiply it by a lot of cavities and a lot of gas atoms that are going through these cavities, suddenly it becomes very significant. And we could be looking at, for example, in one square centimeter of uh, cavity material, we could be looking at outputs possibly as high as four to six watts per square centimeter. Wow. So how uh, much, how big does it need to be to be a light bulb, for example? Uh, just uh, multiply four watts. Uh, you've got a hundred watt light bulb and, uh, uh, let's say four watts per square centimeter. That'd be 20, uh, 25, uh, 25 square centimeters to light a 100 watt light bulb. Okay, so it would so we're be not talking about... interesting. Okay. And the the designs that we use obviously would not use just one uh, passage through a, a Casimir cavity. We would do uh, multiple layers and thicknesses, and we would. Uh, we would uh, leverage the uh, amount of uh, output by uh, increasing the number of uh, uh, square uh, centimeters of uh, pore space. Oh, so you wouldn't? You, you could probably get. You might be able to get that one tenth the size by increasing the number of things in there, so that you could do a light bulb oh, with absolutely. more of the size of a battery. Absolutely. In fact. Uh, this is this is where we plan to take this technology. Uh, we would like to basically enter the marketplace with what would, in effect, be uh, small power cells, which functionally perform like an ordinary battery, but which never require recharging or replacement. And there, and, and these. Is, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, and these are not uh, dangerous. Uh, they're they're safe and. They're um, they're not dangerous at all by getting this energy out of the vacuum field. Uh, there, there there is no uh, no way for this that we can see for it to uh, have any sort of uh, hazard associated with it. The atoms as they go through the uh, system are unchanged, other than that they drop energy and we capture that energy. Uh, and there are there there are no effects that we can think of that. Uh, might make this dangerous in any way whatsoever. So this is amazing. Okay, so how are you planning on using this technology? You're going to create batteries. You started explaining that, and I had to just talk about the dangerous thing, that it's not dangerous. But how how are you going to do this? You're going to make batteries, and, and what kinds of products and things are you going to put it in? Our focus is going to be initially just on small uh, energy cells, uh, which you could use in a flashlight, a laptop computer, a cell phone, uh, a possibly a, a small electric appliance, electric tools, anything where you needed mobile power that was available at an energy level that would be more keeping with uh, what's associated with uh, normal utilities. So uh, you mean no more cell phone. no more recharging our cell phone or plugging in our laptop every. Nope. Five? Every few hours, we could no just go. Wow, and my daughter no could sit and watch her movie, her movies on the airplane, and we wouldn't have to worry about them running out if we're on a long flight. 
precisely. And, and you know how many uh, you know how many plot lines in Hollywood movies depend on a cell phone battery dying? Yeah, it's just it's, a, it's amazing. People uh, people live with a constant uh, presence hanging over them of their cell phone going dead because the battery dies. And this is something that this technology has the potential to uh, totally eliminate. Wow, and, this is uh, amazing. So, the other thing that it will eliminate, which is a special yeah. uh, favorite of mine, is it will eliminate the need for extension cords. Well, yeah, we got cords all over the place. Yes. Or lights outside. I, I have a personal hatred of extension cords. Now, is it going to be dim like a solar light is, or is it going to be nice and bright? Uh, it's going to be what you want it because the amount of energy depends directly on the amount of gas going through the cavities at any given moment. So the power cell is going to be designed to actually read the energy requirement of the load that's applied to it, and it will circulate gas through the cell at the rate necessary to provide that energy and a small amount of energy over and above to maintain the operation of the circulating device in the uh, cell. So basically think of it as a, a membrane with hundreds and hundreds of millions of very tiny pores that gas is being allowed to pass through and then recirculate over and over, and we're capturing the photons as they come off from the uh, cavities and converting that to useful electricity. Wow. Well, is this going to be a fortune? I mean, can you really, is this something that can be made at an economic level that the average Joe on the street will end up being able to purchase? When we first started the program, because Casimir cavities are traditionally uh, in uh, research, uh, are made using uh, gold as a wall material, we thought that they might be a bit on the pricey side. What we found, to our amazement, is that we can use a lot of materials as the walls of the Casimir cavity. And in fact, we have used a very simple, very inexpensive uh, polymer uh, uh, membrane that's used in filtration in laboratories all over the world, something called a Wattman filter, and we've actually demonstrated the process with a Wattman filter. Uh, and this is this was crude, but it was uh, it was a big surprise. We found that the materials of construction are going to be presumably very inexpensive, and we've recently uh, latched on to some technology thanks to the advent of uh, significant growth and development in nanolithography and uh, nano self-assembly technologies, whereby we can produce massive large sheets of uh, Casimir cavity materials at an incredibly low cost. So we envision the uh, Jovian energy cells actually being not only price competitive with ordinary batteries today, but probably having a significant uh, cost advantage over uh, conventional batteries today. Wow, we, this we see this as a very real possibility. Well, this could be really uh, uh, this this could be this definitely is a game changer for sure. So. You're working with the University of Colorado Boulder on this. They hold the patents, right, on this technology. And how is your company working with them? Uh, preliminary investigation of the process was conducted in the Quantum Engineering Laboratory at the University of Colorado by Dr. Garrett Modell, who is one of the inventors of the process. Uh, we've done several studies uh, at the university at this point, uh, and as part of our relationship with the university, uh, the university holds title to the original patent on the technology, and we have uh, universal and global rights uh, for marketing and use. And uh, that is the nature of our relationship. And the scientists that came up with it are actively involved in the company, correct? Yes, they are. Well, I know there, there are two inventors, Dr. Bernard Heisch, who is a retired astro astrophysicist and uh, popular writer, and uh, Dr. Garrett Modell, who is full professor at the University of Colorado. Well, I know that a lot of the universities now are working with their science departments, their technology departments, and trying to um, monetize their what their professors and their departments are coming up with to try to get it out to the marketplace. And I would assume this is more what Boulder is doing with you. 
one of those projects? Well, we are we are working uh, independently of the university with respect to our commercialization efforts. Uh, we haven't asked the university to participate in that form. Uh, we would like to maintain a certain amount of uh, independence uh, for uh, control of the technology, especially as our patent portfolio expands. Uh, we are just at the very edge, very cutting edge of a brand new field, and we envision probably uh, well over a hundred or more patents issuing from this technology as the basic research moves forward. Uh, this is an area that is going to open up many, many technological doors uh, that um, and, and we would like to we would like to have a considerable level of control over the technology. Well, this would be incredible. So, what what are phase are you at right now? When do you think a product like this is going to be at to market? We are currently uh, at a stage where we are uh, raising funding now to complete the proof of concept. Uh, we have demonstrated the process in the laboratory on several occasions, uh, and uh, we are now interested in taking. Uh, that work and applying that work to uh, the uh, engineering and construction of a uh, larger uh, unit, uh, basically a benchtop uh, scale device, which uh, we intend to demonstrate. Uh, and our, our objective is to demonstrate a device which operates at what is commonly referred to as older unity, i.e. the process produces more energy than is required uh, for its own operation. In other words, uh, it will not only be able to maintain its circulation of uh, gas flow through the device, but it will also be able to supply additional energy to do useful work. And I'm thinking now in terms of lighting a light bulb, running an electric drill, uh, I'm thinking that uh, our, our benchtop unit will probably be in the 5 to 10 uh, maybe higher watts uh, in terms of its output, um, and so then you so, can go after uh, you like you can start doing smaller devices. And and what time frame are you thinking? Next year? I think by uh, I think by late 2017 we can expect to have a working prototype of a Jovian energy cell that will be ready to uh, convert to uh, early commercialization. And you have this all working in a lab, correct, already? I mean, you've proven out this technology. We have demonstrated the technology, but we have not proven it to our own satisfaction yet. Uh, we have demonstrated that the flow of gases through Casimir cavities definitely produces energy signals which have no other rational explanation other than that we're extracting them by the Jovian uh, concept. But we now need to take that to the level where we can take it to any uh, peer-reviewed group, or we can take it to any uh, any reputable journal, and we can publish. We we need uh, we need material which meets the criteria of the academic community, the scientific community, the business community, and the technical community to satisfy all of their questions and all of their requirements. So what are the obstacles that you have now? What are you trying to, I mean, what do you foresee as your, your obstacles and what you're trying to do? Biggest obstacle at the moment is we need to raise about two and a half million dollars to complete the proof of uh, testing, uh, proof of concept testing, and to then uh, actually build and operate a unit that uh, provides substantially more energy out than is required to operate it. So if we, if the United States doesn't do this, do you think there'll be other countries that'll end up beating us to this new development? This unfortunately keeps me awake at nights because nature abhors a vacuum and if we don't do this, somebody else will. Fortunately, okay. our initial patent uh, is broad and uh, as we move forward, we're going to be expanding our patent portfolio dramatically. 
but ultimately uh, it would not be uh, it would not be outside the scope of reasonableness to think of rogue nations who don't respect the uh, international patent regulations the way we do to uh, jump into the game and uh, try to undercut us. So, well, the, yes, the, there's there a is, lot of there countries is, that don't. Uh, there's a lot of countries that don't uh, acknowledge it. That's correct, and that that is a source of concern. But uh, the U.S. market, the European market, uh, those markets who do respect uh, global patent uh, treaties, uh, they represent a large enough market that uh, we're not concerned about uh, the financial impact of it. But uh, I really would like to get there first. How incredible is this? Okay, so when, where can we see more about this and what you're doing? And, and how can, first of all, how can people get involved and if, if they want to invest and learn more about your stuff and what's going on? How can they go about doing that? Well, we have a website, uh, www.jovian, J O V I O M, dot com, www dot jovian dot com and I would I would I, I would want to say one more time Jovian J O V I O N uh, is the uh, correct spelling of the company name and this is certainly a place to learn more of the technical detail and a little bit about the management and the vision of the uh, company uh, but if somebody is really interested in this I would invite them to pick up the phone and call me personally. I'd be happy to talk to them, meet with them. Uh, I welcome email communications. I don't tweet, generally speaking, but uh, I, I do uh, I do an aggressive email uh, correspondence, and uh, I am very approachable. If somebody wants to call me and talk, I will talk to them, uh, and I don't care if uh, you know. I don't care if you're uh, you know a uh, a, a universally recognized scientist or, you know, a layman from the street who just happens to be interested, I'm interested in talking with you. And uh, so... Uh, uh, you better be careful. You You're going like to get bombarded with phone calls. Phone <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. I, I'll have your phone number on my web page and on my radio page, and I'll I'll have that all up there for people. You can give it out now if you want. Uh, yes, and uh, if they want to to me quickly and easily, the best thing to do is use my cell phone, which is area code 614-361-2162. Well, before we, we stop, I want to ask you, where do you see this technology going? Like you said there's going to be hundreds of patents and stuff. Where do you see this technology going and how big of a market do you think this really is? I wouldn't. I wouldn't have a, a way of envisioning just the the ultimate outreach of this thing. First of all, uh, just thinking in terms of the immediate market that I'm focused on right now, which is simply drop-in replacements for ordinary batteries, uh, the U.S. market is on the order of $18, $19 billion uh, presently uh, for battery markets. Uh, the global battery market is about 130 some odd billion. Uh, uh, so the, just the battery market alone is staggering. If we go beyond the battery market and if we start looking at, uh, applications outside the battery market, uh, it just sort of then branches out and the sky's the limit. I don't, I don't want to be one of those guys who shouts and arm waves and, uh, you know, oversell something. I'm, that that's not the, that's not the way I do things. So you're but, walking, uh, you're walking the, cautiously right now because there's a huge amount of potential here, but you really got to get it to work on a small level and with batteries and basic things and see what it really can do. See what the, the, the potential really is right if i can just simply put a battery in the hands of anybody who has a device and let them see it let them use it uh they'll understand the value of it uh uh one of the one of the great things about this technology is uh it does not appear to have any mechanism whereby you can weaponize it uh it is not like some energy technologies which uh can be uh, terribly disruptive, and more than that, it has tremendous potential applications 
uh, to provide cheap, inexpensive, very robust, portable energy for third world and developing nations. And well, it, it sounds like it's safer. Humanitarian impact. Well, it sounds like it's safer than oil and, you know, or electricity even, because electricity can be dangerous, the, the, you know, the flow of currents. And then with the poverty yeah. all over the world, it seems like it could be a really, it could be something really fantastic. Yes, what, what we could do to help people in third world settings, uh, it's just, you know, there's just really no end of it. We could make uh, possible uh, heating, refrigeration, cooking, uh, medical uh, support, all of the things that uh, currently are just not available in many areas. Well, and I think getting a working battery and starting to get it out on, you know, flashlights and computers and cell phones and things would be uh, just right, just that would be a huge step forward. That's that's where we want to go. Well, you know what? Thank you so much for joining us. I'm, I'm just really excited. I'm, this is something that I'm going to be following quite a bit. And I'm definitely going to have your information up on my uh, web page and on my radio page. And hopefully people will take advantage of getting hold of you. And I'm sure the amount of money that you're asking for is just a drop in the bucket for some of these really, really wealthy people out there that need something really good to invest in. <laughs> so I think I can, I think I can tell you that uh, we have an opportunity that uh, the right investor is going to uh, just be absolutely excited beyond belief uh, at the potential. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, chatting with that person. Okay. Well, that sounds fantastic. And, and for now, you have a wonderful day. Sarah, thank you so much. Thanks for your delight. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. That's an amazing product that they have. So I am very excited to see how that works and watch as it goes to market. It will be, I for one would like to have no cords for my laptop and definitely would like to see my daughter's cell phone stop running out of battery because she's FaceTiming and taking so many selfies. And it's just, uh, I mean, it would just be amazing. So I'm really going to keep an eye on that. So now we're going to welcome Tom Shepard to the program, and he's going to be talking all about our natures and how we can use that in a positive way to be smarter with our money and our health. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the program. Uh, hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me on. Well, I, you know, I've had you on for a while, but I wanted to have you back so that we could talk about this more in depth. I've had a lot of people be, they're interested in your seven personality traits and how it works for evolving money and just for life in general. And I wanted to have you back for a longer segment so that we could really dive into this and people could get a better idea of what this all is, what this is all about. But could you give us an overview, and then we could dive into it more about the seven personality traits and what you do with that? Right. Um, so there are seven basic relationships that people can have with money. And I, I came across these relationships by just working with people over the last 20 years, um, realizing that different people say different things things but mean the same thing um, and so trying to clarify some things for myself for my clients to give them more insight into who they actually are and how they make decisions um, we came up with this um, nomenclature a way of, of talking about the different natures that that people have um, and where where this really kind of solidified for me was when I started having kids of my own. And uh, I've got three kids that they each have a different nature. It is so clear that they are wired differently. Well, every kid is. They come out just totally different. Um, but there can't be an infinite number of different types. And, and so, so I'll quickly go through the natures, and um, I think you're going to find I use different terms to capture a different form of essence, but but there really are only only seven natures. Um, so the first nature is what we call the reactive. Um, these are folks who um, use instinct more than thought 
um, to make decisions about their finances. Um, it, any one of these natures can have positive attributes or negative attributes, but we, we try to stay neutral on it because it can be good. It doesn't have to be bad. So being reactive is not necessarily a bad trait. It's just a way to describe the first nature. The second nature is what we call the feeling nature, um, where people oftentimes will use um, excitement or enthusiasm to get themselves to make financial decisions. The third is what I do that sometimes. So that would that be if you're at the store and you see something amazing and you just are excited about it and you do it, or if you see uh, an interesting investment just because you're excited about it, you would be you do you put money towards that because it's exciting. Yeah, but there's a difference between being in the moment and having a, a an event kind of overwhelm you or being in a role and having that role define how you react or how you have to sort of be what your what your essence is versus your nature. So because all people are made up of all seven, it's the dominant one that determines what your nature actually is. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so so a reactive person will also have feelings and want to do work. <laughs> um, but the third one is the worker, and that's really about effort um, and striving. And if that's your nature, um, then there are different kinds of words than, that will describe um, who you are and how you're wired. The, the fourth one we call the saver. Um, I have one daughter who's a saver. She loves to relax. Um, it doesn't mean she doesn't work hard and she's not driven. It just means that her dominant sort of way of existing in the world is to find opportunity uh, to save herself from the, the, the drama. Um, so she loves to follow rules. And um, there's just a whole series of words. There's a certain amount of wisdom in saving yourself from drama. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Right? I mean, that's the positive part of that. Yeah. But in the process, um, she sometimes creates a different kind of drama because of her nature. Um, Would it also mean, would that also mean maybe avoiding conflict? Um, oftentimes it's avoiding certain types of conflict, but then getting mad when somebody else creates the drama and then the drama becomes the drama. So oh, okay. <laughs> it's kind of a layered, a layered thing. Um, so the fifth nature is the investor. Um, this is where you're really looking to create almost like a second um, source or a second energy or a second um, purpose. Um, so there are some people who are always looking for putting this together with that. Um, so synergy would be a, a word that would often be ascribed to talking about the, the investor nature. And that's the one that when I took your <laughs> little thing to figure out what you are, I turned out to be more than likely an investor. And through the last couple of months of knowing you, I've learned a lot about that. And I think we can talk about it a little bit later after you get done kind of giving your overview, but it's uh, made me think differently about how to go forward. I, I, I love hearing that. Um, and that's, you know, this really started for me as a quest to understand myself and, um, so that other people can can get to know their themselves better is is the bonus you know it's the frosting on top of the cake um but my nature is the next one it's a, it's the sixth one and it's it's the lever and what levers like is they like things to be easy but easy and still accomplishing bigger and better things so the pos- the positive is utilizing what you have around you and being smart about doing things. But the negative in that is maybe if it's not easy, it's frustrating. If it's not easy, it can become frustrating, and then your frustration can create the drama because now your frustration is 
is what everybody is dealing with. So a lever, think of a lever as, as being something that makes things easier. Um, levers like to elevate the game. They don't like to get dragged into the, into the mud. Um, and yet, um, unknown, they can create their own, um, uh, muck <laughs> and, and get mired in it. So, you know, when we talk about leverage as opposed to debt, um, debt has a weight to it that leverage does not. And, and so it's, it's very interesting to see some people get weighed down by their debt and other people be elevated by the leverage that they employ, especially in, in finances. Interesting. Okay. So what is the, the final one? So the final one is the giver. And so the giver, um, you know, again, I, I'm going to, I'm going to say that there is no positive or negative in any of the names. They are all neutral. It's, it's really, you know, do you identify with it and are you able to use it in a productive and loving way as opposed to in a destructive and controlling way? And so a giver, um, you know, might be somebody who, who wants to give, but they're so interested in giving, they don't realize that nobody wants what they're giving. <laughs> that's, that's one. Nobody side wants of them it. around, or could it be a martyr too? Like they're the other side of it is martyr. Okay. And so every every nature has you know a positive, but you can overdo it, and every nature has a negative, and you can overdo that. And even though I put them in that order. And, and give them a number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they are not in a, in a hierarchical order. Um, it's not like one's better, better than seven no. or anything. No, it's, they're, they're, they're all just how you're wired. And if you actually want to become better, you might be able to borrow something from the other natures that helps elevate you to a higher level of you. So if I'm a lever, I don't need to become a giver. I need to use giving as a means to become a higher order lever. You don't need to save yourself you know, from, uh, from people. You need to invest in people to help raise yourself to a higher level. And I need to learn how to um, make sure I keep leveraging the things around me and not just move on to another newer, more interesting thing. <laughs> Cause right, I, you know, right. I tend to have that short span of where I always want to get into new stuff, but that, and that's great, but make sure you take advantage of the stuff that you've already been involved in. Right. Why not leverage the stuff you've already invested in to make things easier so that you can have the gift of a little bit more time and energy that can be repurposed to something else that you're passionate about and then go to work on that. And that will then create another higher version of yourself. And, and, that's, and that's the key to this whole thing is to realize that there are seven natures. You have a dominant one, and you don't want to be overwhelmed by it. You don't want to deny it, but you actually want to use it and the other natures to get yourself to a higher version of yourself. Well, how uh, how have you been using this for clients? Because I know a lot of people have had some positive results with this. Can you share some of the some of the things you're doing with people and how you're using it? Yeah, there's two there's two really key takeaways. Um, the first one is when we work with a couple. So if you if you and your significant other come in, you sit down across from me, and you start talking about saving. And she's talking about how hard it is to pay all the bills. Um, and you're both working and you've got kids and, and we actually have you take our, our, uh, profile, uh, quiz questionnaire, um, call it what you want. And where can um, they get that? Cause that's really interesting for people to do. Just right on yeah, your website. They, they, yeah, right on our website, shepherd uh, financial.com. Um, so we, we give this to them, and then they kind of are able to know what their nature is. And the process of taking that introduces different vocabulary 
that should mean the same thing but often doesn't. So, for example, we, we had this um, couple who came in. He was a saver. He was working. He liked saving money. They had money in savings. Um, but the savings was retirement savings. And she was more of a, um, a feeler type. Um, she was working. She was in charge of paying all the bills, and they didn't actually have any non-retirement savings. And so her nature and her role left her emotionally drained because she was trying to pay the bills and they didn't have enough money, and yet they had money. So you got one person in the relationship stressed out, and you got the other person in the relationship at ease because all of his needs are being met and none of hers are. And and it's hard for somebody when you, you their needs aren't met. It's hard for you to appreciate that because you they're met for you and you don't understand why they don't why they're so stressed. Right. So so what we were able to help them to do was identify the communication gaps, identify their natures, identify the roles and the situation, and by mapping that all out for them, they could begin to see a light at the end of the tunnel with respect to getting the kids all into school. Then there wouldn't be so much daycare need. The expenses would go down. And you're just able to map out the money for them and help them have a conversation about it so that each person in the the, the, the family unit is helping the family address all seven natures. Because remember, she's one, he's another. They've each got a role to play. They also exist in a situation that is um, based on time in their life, and they have to navigate that. And they can't skip any of those things because they all go in order. Well, and you based – you're a lot like – I don't know if you based it, but you're a lot like a lot of the other – but you've taken it, taken it to a much deeper level on um there's a writer out there now his name has escaped me and it, you, you're you've taken these ideas but taken it to a whole nother level with putting categories around it and trying to really um, help people understand how their natures what their natures are uh do you know what i'm talking about when i'm talking about the the writer that's out there and has there's there's so many people writing about um you know, the different states or levels or paradigms. Um, you know, Covey's got the seven habits. Of yes, and I've had them on. Deepak Chopra's got the seven laws of spiritual success. Um, so there's so many different places where these words come up, um, but it's hard to remember them all. So you have to sort of become a specialist in time management or a specialist in relationship management and study these things to remember what they are. What what has been really helpful for us is to show people the mathematical relationship, the black and white, that these these natures are um, easy enough to uh, show how they relate, so that you will buy into the idea that you cannot skip them. They have to go. You have to go in a certain order. So even though there's an order to them, there is no hierarchy. Well, and that's important because if there was a hierarchy in our culture, people wouldn't it wouldn't go over very well anyways. <laughs> right. I mean, like you're an investor, I'm a lever, and somebody else is a giver, and we're going to fight over who's, like, better. <laughs> <laughs> we're, you know, we need to be done. We need to be done with that. we got to stop saying that debt is evil, and we need to get the idea that leverage can be good. Yeah. Well, and we have to, it is what it is, and we just have to work with what we have. But, and that's what's so amazing. You've been approached by uh, different large healthcare organizations to implement it, uh, it, you know, across organizations. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So we were, we were recently um, talking to some, some people who are trying to figure out how to, how to sort of broaden healthcare to incorporate more of the wellness approach. And as a result of a uh, survey of human resources folks, um, they got feedback that the single best 
benefit that many of the, the uh, employers have put in place is built around the idea of financial literacy. Well, because most, yeah. most stress – and, you know, right. stress causes right. so much, you know, so many problems with your health. Health, one of the biggest stressors is financial. And now with right. the, you know, and people are really stressed out now with the uncertainty that's going on in the market. And you can just see the anxiety everywhere. So it's such a timely issue to really get an understanding of yourself and the emotions around this. So what was really powerful for this person to approach us was when we talked about currency as money and we come up with these different uh, natures, um, change the name, call it a paradigm, change the name again, call it a state or a level. And I was talking to them. I said, look, you know, money is a currency and so is food. <laughs> and so food obeys the same order. And so you can you can eat food and get sick, and you can eat food and you can be okay, and you can eat food and you can be really well. And um, if you know what the order is, then you can actually start working at improving who you are based on what you eat, not just how you spend money. Yeah, because you are what you eat. You are what you surround yourself with. You are what you think. Right, and, and, and the nature of any food comes back to, um, you know, is it is it like bright orange Cheetos, you know, radioactive, <laughs> or, or is it something that's actually um, necessary for building and repair, or is it necessary for optimal thought? Um, you know, there are different orders. Um, to the way that um, health works, there's different order to the way that relationships work, and there's a different order to the way that time management works. But we're all taking the same idea, a currency, and discussing the different ways that we can trade that currency. Well, where... that's, where the, that's where the healthcare people were like, wait, there's something here for us to to look at how can we work with people to educate them so that they will be healthier and need less health care. Well, yeah, because that's the whole the whole deal. So how can um, – you have a book that's coming out soon, which is exciting, and you have – you also help people through this. There's <laughs> – I know with the way the economy is, there's lots of people with anxiety and, and needing to work through some of this stuff. So how can people um, see more of you work and get hold of you? Your website, is that the first start? Do that assessment and then go from there? Yeah, the, web, the website's a good place to just kind of explore some of our ideas. Um, we are um, head, heading out to uh, Colorado this weekend to try and wrap up uh, the writing of the book. Um, do some final editing, and um, we are also, um, uh, you can sign up for a newsletter. You can take the, um, the, the financial natures quiz online. Um, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Um, and, and, you know, we're also getting kind of excited about maybe getting around and making uh, a little bit of a speaking tour. Um, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, um, but it's it's um, it's been really exciting, and and everybody who's who's engaged with us to one level or another um, just seems to want to know more. So, <laughs> well, yeah, like I said, you've really helped me start thinking about myself and and some of my my flaws. <laughs> I, my husband would say I have many flaws. I would say I I don't, but. Actually, no, I would, my flaws go around the block with, you know, you write it out on a little piece of paper and tiny little writing and it goes around the earth a million times. But I, I appreciate you coming on the air and talking to us about this. I, uh, I know it's a timely issue right now. Yeah. I mean, there's one story that's going to make it into the book about, um, this person I was working with and how they had, you know, trained a woman. She was a great worker. Um, she rose to the occasion, allowed them to save lots of money, and they got to the point where it really was time to make a decision about whether they should invest in her or not. In other words, her development was moving along that ordered path. And, um, 
you know, she started to struggle because she hadn't, they hadn't made the investment in her. And um, so I talked him through that. And, and you know, more recently, I find my, found myself almost making the exact same mistake he did. <laughs> well, the thing is, is it's not always their fault. It could be because you're not doing the right things and your, uh, your natures are causing that to occur. Right. And I'm but, kind of the uh, same way. I get really impatient when things aren't a certain way, but it could be because you aren't giving what you need to be giving to them. <laughs> I see that yeah, as a so, giving issue in some ways. Right. So as, as as ordered as this is, it's still really crucial that people work with it and develop um, uh, some familiarity in order to um, avoid just sort of fallen back into the same old trap that you've always been trapped in. Exactly. Be more aware. It's that that mindfulness of what you're doing. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Tom. I hope you have a great day, and thanks for showing, sharing all this with us. You're very welcome. Well, I told you I had a great lineup coming today, so I hope you like those interviews. And if you want to find more information on how to get hold of our guests, you can go to my website at sarahwestall.com and get information there. I also have all my past shows and tons of innovation, disruption, all about economics and different industries. I have about 60 shows loaded there, so you can get all of that there as well. So for now, everyone have a wonderful day.